Respected brothers and sisters, before we continue with tonight's discussion of the characteristics and the attributes which it is important for us as believers to be aware of and to try to develop, I would request all of you to remember the believers, mu'mineen, members of our community, our families, those who may have asked us for our prayers who are no longer amongst us, and especially the marhumeen of those who have sponsored tonight's majlis. You are requested to recite a surah fatiha for Sayyid Asghar Nawab, Abbas Ali Jafari, Anis al Nisa Jafari, Mumtaz Zahra Rizvi, and all other marhumeen and marhumat. Proceeded by Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Yesterday we began our discussion by talking about the importance of certain characteristics and certain attributes in order for us to be believers. Our faith and our iman and the deepening of our faith and the preserving of our faith and the maintaining of our faith throughout our lives so that it can be a benefit to us. It is not simply a matter of knowing certain things. There are many people in history who have known many different true and meaningful and important and very profound facts. Many educated people, many intelligent people, many experienced people who have knowledge and intelligence that many of us may not have. But that doesn't mean that they were successful as human beings. And that doesn't mean that they were able to achieve salvation. In fact, if you look at the correlation of what we think of as intelligence and success and salvation, then you will find there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence. There are many people who may be very smart, and they are also faithful and they will achieve success and salvation. But there are many people who are equally intelligent, equally smart, equally educated and equally experienced who will be the first people to go to hell and achieve perdition, not have any success and not be able to achieve salvation. 
So it can be something which is helpful to us to be smart, but it is not something which is going to ensure or guarantee our salvation. What is more important is for us to have certain attributes. When we have certain attributes, they will facilitate our success and our salvation. Those attributes by themselves are also not sufficient. It is not enough for a person to have certain good characteristics, certain good habits, certain good qualities in order to achieve salvation. But having those good attributes they can play a very important role in helping and facilitating our achievement of salvation. Living a successful life in this world, which even many wealthy people and even many educated people and even many intelligent people are unable to do. And also facilitating our salvation in the hereafter. Now this is one point that I made yesterday with regard to a school of thought that existed and was very prominent in Islamic history known as the Mu'tazila, which does not really exist in any large numbers today, but through their emphasis on the deeper understanding of Tawheed. It was not a perfect understanding of Tawheed, but it was a deeper understanding of Tawheed than was held by common Muslims. Many Muslims, even today, they actually believe that Allah has a hand and that Allah has limbs. They believe that Allah is found in the heavens, that He has a place where Allah can be said to be found. And they believe that believers will be able to see Allah with their eyes in the hereafter. I don't want to generalize. Not all Sunnis have these beliefs, but there are a number of Muslims, unfortunately too large a number of Muslims, who have this superficial understanding of Tawheed, where they think that Tawheed is harmonious with actually being able to see Allah. They don't say that we will see Allah in this world, but they say the believers will be able to see Allah in the hereafter. The Mu'tazila were one of those groups that had a better and a deeper understanding of Tawheed. They had some kind of affiliation or some kind of attachment to Ahlul Bayt even if they didn't recognize them as Imams. And many of them, they had a special attachment to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib <laughs> Some of their scholars wrote books answering the criticisms which were made of some of the actions and the decisions of Imam Ali and defending him and affirming that there was nobody among the followers and among the companions of the Prophet who was equal to Imam Ali. This connection which they had to Ahlul Bayt, even though it was imperfect, even though it was incomplete, even though it was deficient, it still had a benefit that brought them closer to the true teachings of Islam as taught by Ahlul Bayt, and it gave them some benefit in that they were able to distinguish some things which many other Muslims were unable to distinguish. There is a tendency among many believers, not just Shia, among Muslims as a whole, among followers of Ahlul Bayt in particular, that sometimes we see the world only in terms of black and white. And when we see the, ter the world in terms of black and white, we are not able to appreciate the different shades of gray, the different gradations, which have an effect in how we are to deal with different people. It's not the case that everybody who is wrong is also to be condemned. It is not the case that everybody who is wrong is to be turned away. It is not the case 
that everybody who does not understand the truth, I have a right to say that I don't care whether they understand or they don't understand. If they don't understand, that's their problem. In some cases, it is our problem. And it is our fault if we turn them away before we have given them a chance to understand what our religion, what our teachings, and what the teachings of Ahlul Bayt are about. In Surah Al-Fatiha, we have been taught by Allah to divide in our conscience and in our <coughs> mind people into three categories. What are those three categories? We pray to Allah, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ That is the first category. There are people whom Allah has bestowed His favor and His ni'mah and His blessing upon. These are the people whom we have a wilayah towards. Those whom Allah has given His perfect blessing to, they are Ahlul Bayt. They are our leaders. And everybody who recognizes Ahlul Bayt and believes in Ahlul Bayt as their leaders and as their role models, we have a connection to them as well. So we have a loyalty and an identity and a responsibility to that group. Now for many of us, we say that's one group and then everybody else is in the other group. We don't make any other distinctions. They are followers of Ahlul Bayt. And what is the other group? Anybody who is not a follower of Ahlul Bayt. But that is not what the Quran does. The Quran says that we should pray to Allah, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ There are two other groups. Those who are worthy of the ghadab and the anger and the wrath and the punishment of Allah. Those are people we should take a strong stance against. It doesn't matter what day and what time and what era we might live in. If it was the time of the Prophet, it was Abu Sufyan. It was Abu Jahl. It was Abu Lahab. If it was the time of Imam Ali, it was Muawiyah. If it was the time of Imam Hassan, it was still Muawiyah who claimed to have a position which Allah had not given him. If it was the time of Imam Hussein, it was Yazid. And so on until our time, taking a stance against those who stand deliberately and knowingly against justice and against truth, that is our slogan and that is our responsibility. But that is not everybody who is not a follower of Ahlul Bayt. The third group which is mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha is وَلَضَّالِينَ There are some people who are ضَالِينَ They are misguided. They are astray. They are not on the right path. But Allah does not include them among غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ He doesn't include them in الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ He doesn't say that they are going to be punished by Allah. They are astray. They are misguided. They are not on the right path. Now Allah knows those who are misguided, which of them should have known better and could have known better and should have followed the truth or at least had some curiosity to do research and understand the truth. These people Allah might punish them on the Day of Judgment. He knows, we don't know. And there are some people who may be misguided because they did not have an opportunity to know the truth. Either the truth did not reach them, or they may have heard something about Muslims or seen something about Muslims, which was so offensive that they did not even think that there might be some truth to this religion, and the person that I am seeing or the person whom I am familiar with, he might not be or she might not be a good representative of that religion. These people, they may be astray, because they have not heard the truth and they have not accepted the truth. But Allah might not punish them because it's not their fault. Now, Surah Al-Fatiha does not say who these groups are. If you go to books of tafsir, many Muslims, they like to make general categories. They say that anamta alayhim, anamta alayhim, that is all of the Muslims. al maghdub alayhim, that is all Jews, for example. And al that is the Christians. But that is not what the Qur'an itself does. If Allah wanted to make that kind of a very superficial and a very easy distinction, 
then Allah could have said, Sirat al Muslimin, Ghayr al Yahud wa Ghayr al Nasara. Allah doesn't do that. So it's not that Al Ladina Anamta Alayhim is all of the Muslims. There are some Muslims who have that favor, but there are some Muslims who may fall into one of the other categories, depending on what is in their heart. There may be some Jews who are worthy of Allah's wrath and punishment, but there may be others who are not. There may be some Christians who are in the third category, they are astray, but there may be some who are worthy of Allah's wrath and punishment as well. We cannot say and we cannot judge, but what we know is that there are these different categories of people, and we are to have a different relationship based on what types of attributes people have. We are to have a different response to people based on what position we find ourselves in within society. Yesterday I made the point that it was not the practice of Ahlul Bayt any of the members of Ahlul Bayt, to turn people away needlessly. These majalis which we take pride in attending, in convening, in establishing, these are something which were established by Ahlul Bayt themselves. These are majalis which were commanded and which were joined by Imam Muhammad Baqir oh. by Imam Ja'far Sadiq oh. by Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida oh. and they themselves would invite poets and call them to recite Qasida and recite Marthiya just as we had so many members of our community and I would like to give a special recognition and thanks to all of those who came forward and expressed their love of Ahlul Bayt by this recitation of poetry. This is something which Ahlul Bayt, the Imams themselves, used to call people to do. And when poetry was recited about Ahlul Bayt, then the Imams would not just do that in their regular gatherings, but they would actually invite their family their women folk and their children, and they would say that all should participate in these gatherings. In these gatherings, it was not the practice of the Imams to say things which might turn people away or which might give them the wrong impression about our belief. If we hear something or if we say something which is contrary to the practice and the priorities of Ahlul Bayt, then each and every one of us has a responsibility. Whether it be somebody who is sitting on the mimbab, or somebody who is reciting poetry, or whether it is an audience member who is sitting below the podium, each of us has a responsibility. Not to praise things which might sound very satisfying, but which are not in accordance with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Not to encourage and not to seek those types of messages which are contrary to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Now yesterday I mentioned for example that in the gathering of Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida alayhi salatu was salam he gave people a message of Tawheed where he said كَلِمَةُ لَا إِلَٰهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ This word, لَا إِلَٰهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ, this phrase, this sentence, Allah says, it is my fort. Anybody who enters into my fort, that person is safe from my punishment and from harm. And then the Imam, he only gave a little nudge, a hint, a push, so that people will think more about what it means to believe in Tawheed. And he told them that one of the conditions of Tawheed is to recognize Imam of their time. That was in their time, the eighth Imam. And in other times it was the other Imam. The Imam did not say so explicitly. He didn't say that you have to know all eight Imams from the first Imam until my time. And you have to know all of the hukuk and the rights of the Imam. And the Imam is ma'soom. And the Imam is wajib al ta'a, must be obeyed. All of those attributes, the Imam did not mention it in this hadith. But he gave people a nudge and a push. Because the importance of Tawheed is such 
that we are to give a clear message to all of the world that Muslims believe in Tawheed. Our loyalty, our friendship, and our connection to each other and to any other human being, it is through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in some cases, and now I want to move on from our discussion yesterday, in some cases, even if a person does not believe in Tawheed, there are instances where Allah Himself says that we are to deal with people with a certain softness because of certain attributes. Even if the person is a mushrik. Even if the person not only is a mushrik, but is somebody who has called other people towards shirk. I want to begin with the hadith of our 8th Imam, Imam Ali Rada alayhi salatu wa There is a hadith from our 8th Imam, it is also attributed in a similar form to the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa The hadith is that as-sakhi qareebun min Allah, qareebun min al-jannah, qareebun min al-nas, ba'eedun min al-nar. That a person who is generous, such a person, is close to Allah, close to paradise, close to the hearts of the people, and far away from hellfire. وَالْبَخِيلُ بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ الْجَنَّةِ بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ قَرِيبٌ مِّنَ النَّارِ And a person who is stingy, that is the exact opposite. They are far from Allah, far from paradise, far from the hearts of people, and they are close to hellfire. Now this is a hadith of the Prophet in one form, a hadith of our eighth Imam, in this complete form that I just read for you, it is a mention of one attribute which is in some way very closely related to Tawheed. Because a true generous person can only be somebody who has a level of tawakkul, reliance in Allah, and a level of husnul dhan and a good opinion about Allah. People are stingy, we are stingy, when we think that we have been given a blessing, but we don't know if maybe Allah did it by mistake. He gave me some money, He gave me good health, He gave me some resource, something, and maybe Allah didn't intend to do so, and He's not going to do so again. And so we have a bad opinion of Allah, and we think that this is something which now we have to grasp onto and hold onto and never let go. And then if a masjid comes and says that why don't you contribute to this worthy cause, we might have the ability to do so, but we'll say no. A family member comes and asks us for our assistance, we'll say that no, we can't do anything. What if there is a rainy day? If we had a good opinion of Allah, then we would trust that when He helps us in good times, He will help us when we need it, if we do the right thing with our resources. So sakha, or generosity, it has a connection with Tawheed. The connection is that true generosity can only come from a person who is a muwahid, believes in one Allah, and a person who has a good opinion of Allah and his dealings with his servants and his human beings. But sometimes there is a person who has the attribute of generosity and does not outwardly accept Tawheed. Not every generous person is a mu'min. If you ask some people, they will actually say, that you'll find more generous people who are not practicing than you will find generous people who are practicing. And that is a tragedy that we sometimes find within our communities that is not a true believer who is stingy. There are many hadith that say that if you are a mu'min, then you cannot be stingy. Believers have been created from generosity. Whether you pray and fast and go for hajj and do all of those things, if you are stingy, then you are not a mu'min. And it is possible, however, to see the reverse. There is a hadith which is found in Al-Kafi that Allah revealed to Musa about as sami Those of you who are familiar with the Quranic story, you will know, and those of you who are not familiar, I will just briefly mention. When the children of Israel were saved from Fir'aun, they were brought outside of Egypt and into 
the promised land, which was promised not to the Jews as a race, but to the believers. And to the community of believers, at that time the followers of Prophet Musa, afterwards those who accepted Prophet Isa, and in this time the Muslims who accepted all of the prophets of Allah. That promised land, when they were saved by Allah, they saw that there were people who had different idols. And they felt that we don't have any idol for ourselves. All of these other tribes, they have stones, they have gods for themselves, and we don't have an idol. There was one person who collected Bani Israel and actually taught them to worship a golden calf that he had fashioned himself. Now, how serious a sin is this? A person who not only is not a muwahid, but is actually taking the people of Musa whom he has just saved from Egypt, and he is teaching them how to become mushrik, teaching them how to worship an idol, which he has made from their gold and from their possessions, collecting it and fashioning that golden calf. Musa alayhi salam, he had gone at that time for his divine appointment, for his worship and for his munajat with Allah. When he came back, he saw that idol that they had made, he destroyed the idol, and then it was time to punish that person. That person is known in the Quran as a sami the person who taught people to become mushrik. Now somebody who does that knowingly, what is their punishment in the eyes of Allah? Maybe somebody can be excused if they didn't know any better, if they were ignorant. But this is the greatest sin that anybody can commit in humanity, to deliberately, knowingly mislead people away from Tawheed. And somebody had committed that sin. He knew better. He was not ignorant and he was not misled, but he was somebody who knowingly misled other people. Now the hadith tells us that Allah revealed to his prophet, Ya Musa la taqtul samiri O Musa, do not kill Samiri. This man, he is worthy of death because of the evilness of the crime that he has committed. This is the crime that leads people to become disunited, that leads people to follow their own low desires. And every other crime, adultery, stealing, theft, any other crime that might exist within humanity, it comes from following those low desires, it comes from shirk. Or it is worsened by shirk. But Allah says that, O oh Musa, do not kill Samir. Why? فَإِنَّهُ سَخِي because a Samiri was somebody who was generous. When people would come to him, he wouldn't withhold his assistance to people. And because of that, even somebody who has committed such a grave sin, that person is not going to be saved from punishment in the hereafter. They have done evil and they will be dealt with in the hereafter because of the evil that they have committed. But in this world, that punishment is to be put to put on hold. A Samiri was not put to death by Musa for the reason of his generosity. So this is what I was speaking of when I said yesterday that there are certain attributes that bring a person closer to the truth, facilitate and make it easy for a person to be able to achieve success and salvation. Of course, then it is up to the person to make use of that ability and that closeness and actually do the right thing and there are many people who may have an ability but they don't do the right thing as followers of Ahlul Bayt we have to recognize that this is a responsibility that comes on our shoulders to be able to encourage good attributes take a look around the world wherever there was an active community of lovers of Ahlul Bayt, then these processions, these gatherings of mention of Ahlul Bayt, this poetry and praise of Ahlul Bayt, it was not limited to the followers of Ahlul Bayt. There were non-Muslims, in India there are Hindus, in Iran and in Iraq you will go there are Armenian Christians, 
and Assyrian Christians and other communities, they will also participate in these gatherings of commemoration and showing their respects for Ahlul Bayt. Wherever followers of Ahlul Bayt had a presence, they had an influence beyond their own numbers. And one of the re main reasons for it was their generosity. They would open their hearts, they would open their pockets, and they would invite everyone, and they would serve everyone in their community without discrimination. Muslim, non-Muslim, Sunni, Shia, anybody was welcome, wealthy or poor. And that was how they brought people, and many people, they accepted the truth as a result of that. Many people did not understand and they did not go that far, but they also benefited from being present in those gatherings. So it is a responsibility for us. When we are in this country, we also have to recreate that identity, where through generosity, we share our values and our religion and our faith with other people and we invite other people to be able to see and to be able to listen. Peace be upon you, Prophet Muhammad. Now, yesterday I promised that today I would talk a little bit about Islam's view of the Christian religion and especially since now it is Christmas season and the members of our community in this country, they are going to be celebrating Christmas. What is Islam's view on these celebrations and on this religion? Islam talks in the Quran, when we speak of the principles of Islam, we are speaking of the words of the Quran. The Quran talks about Christianity as a religion, and it also talks about Christians as a people. And notice a difference between the clear position, black and white, which Islam draws with regard to what is right and what is wrong, and then that nuanced and that different perspective that Islam gives with regard to followers of a religion which might be wrong. Truth and falsehood is clear. That is where it is fair for us to say that there is black and white. Al-Haqq ma'a Ali wa Aliyun ma'a Al-Haqq. That is black and white. Wherever Imam Ali salam is, that is where there is truth. And wherever Imam Ali is not to be found or whoever is opposed to Imam Ali, that is falsehood. It doesn't matter who it is. So truth and falsehood are going to be clear. What is a right belief and what is a wrong belief. And the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah, it expresses that very clearly. لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ That those who say that God is the Messiah, the son of Maryam, Jesus Christ, they are disbelievers and they are entirely wrong. لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَةٍ those who say that Allah is one of three and there is a trinity and all parts of that trinity, they are divine and they share in the divine essence and Jesus also is God and God is Jesus and they have one essence. These are disbelievers and they are wrong. If you read Surah Al-Ma'idah verses 70, 71, 72, then you will see this clear distinction which Allah makes about the wrong belief of those who worship Jesus Christ or consider him to be God or one with God. Now you might think that the result of this then is to say that Muslims are to have nothing to do with people who are kafir and mushrik and have the wrong religion. But notice now a different language that the Quran uses with regard to Christians. They are wrong in their belief and we should be aware of what our religion teaches us. We're not going to compromise Tawheed. I wanted to make that point also with regard to Nusayris or any other group, whether they call themselves Muslims or they call themselves Christians or they call themselves members of any other religion. Yes, we have a relationship and a certain respect for Christians, as I will talk about in the verses of the Quran. We have a certain respect and a certain affinity in some sense with Nusayris also because of their love for Ahlul Bayt. 
but there is a clear red line, haq and batil is not to be questioned and not to be <coughs> mixed with one another. Wallah. Christians are on the wrong side of that line of haq and batil because they are not with Tawheed, they are not with the Prophet of Islam, and they are not with Ahlul Bayt. Nusaydis are on the wrong side of that line of haq and batil because they do not believe in Tawheed. They do not believe in the proper belief of Nubuwa and the proper understanding of Ahlul Bayt However, with that clear understanding, we also have a relationship with them. So let us look at a few verses of Quran to recite salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first verse that I want to look at is from Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, verse number 55 in the Quran. Allah talks to Prophet Isa alayhi salam directly. He says that Allah says, Ya Isa inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya. That, O oh Isa, I am going to gather your soul and I am going to raise you and elevate you into my presence. And I will purify you and save and protect you from all of those who are kafir. <clears throat> there were enemies of Prophet Jesus in his time who wished to assassinate him. And Allah says that, O oh Jesus, I will protect you, I will save you, and I will raise you to my own presence. Now, this is with regard to what Allah has promised Prophet Isa salam himself, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. But now the next part of this verse, Surah number 3, Ali Imran, verse number 55. Allah says, وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوكَ and I will make those who follow you above those who disbelieve until the day of judgment. Those who believe in Jesus Christ, those who believe in Prophet Isa alayhi salam, they are above those who disbelieve until the day of judgment. Now we might think that this verse is referring only to the Muslims. Because who are the ones who ittaba'u? Prophet Jesus, who followed Prophet Jesus. Properly speaking, it is the Muslims. Prophet Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be a Prophet of God. And who are the ones who believe in Him as a Prophet of God? It is the Muslims. He never claimed to be the only or the final Prophet. He said that there is going to be a Prophet after me, Ismuhu Ahmad, whose name is Ahmad. And who are the people who believe in this prophecy of Prophet Jesus and believe in the Prophet whose coming Prophet Jesus had foretold? It is the Muslims. But this verse, according to many different Mufassireen, it is not exclusive to the Muslims. From the Sunni side, you can look at the famous Mufassir Jalaluddin al-Suyuti. From the Shia side, our Mufassireen also have mentioned the point, Faith Kashani is one of our Mufassireen, the author of Tafsir al-Safi. It is a Tafsir written in Arabic. It's existing in Farsi translation, in Urdu translation, for those of you who may wish to consult it. He also mentions, that when Allah says that those who follow Prophet Jesus are above those who don't follow Prophet Jesus, this is referring to the Muslims and to the Christians. Because they have some affiliation with Prophet Jesus. Even though the Christians do not follow Prophet Jesus properly, but they honor him and they follow him in some way. And so from the Sunni side and from the Shia side, Mufassirin and commentators of the Quran, they have mentioned that this verse it refers to both Muslims and to Christians. There is an affinity and an affiliation between Muslims and Christians. Not because Christians are correct in their belief. That is not to be confused. They are wrong in their belief and any belief which goes against Tawheed is not something that Muslims can ever accept. We can ever justify or we can ever compromise with. We are clear that Allah is only one and only He is worthy of being worshipped. No prophet, no human being, not Prophet Jesus and not even our own Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. They are not worthy of being worshipped and we don't confuse them with the divine essence. But here the Quran is saying there is some affiliation 
between Muslims and Christians. Because many of these Christians, their hearts are in the right place, they are confused, they have been misled by many generations of false teachings, by verses that have been added to their scripture, and for this reason, they might not be fully at fault for some of the confusion that they have. <coughs> now, this is the verse of Surah Ali Imran. I mentioned to you that in Surah Al Ma'idah, and I encourage you to go and consult the Quran, look from verse 70 or 71 onwards. The Quran begins by drawing that clear black and white distinction between what is right and what is wrong. They are wrong. الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمِ they are wrong and they are disbelievers and they are kafir who say الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ That is not something which the Qur'an compromises with. But then later on in Surah Al-Ma'idah in verse number 82, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that although they are wrong, there is some closeness between the Christians and the Muslims. Where Allah says, that if you want to look among the people of the world, you will find among Anas, among the people, there are some who have irreconcilable differences with the Muslims. Those who are mushrik, for example, they will never compromise with the believers. They will always be in opposition. If you look among the different people of the world, those who will be closest to the Muslims, they will be الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى Those who say we are Christians. They are wrong in some of their beliefs. They follow a different religion. They do not accept the Prophet of Islam. They do not accept the Sharia, which it is wajib on a person to accept and to practice. Yet, they have the closest relationship among religions to the believers. And then the Qur'an mentions why that is the case. And here again we return to certain attributes. What are those attributes? ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرُهْبَانًا وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ That is because among the Christians there are قِسِّيسِينَ There are scholars, there are pious people, there are bishops, there are religious people who are learned and truly dedicate their lives to service of Allah. The Qur'an says that these monks and these nuns, that is not something that Allah commanded them to do. But there is a sincerity in their intention when they dedicate themselves and they take a vow of poverty and a vow of celibacy, even if it's not something which Allah ordered them to do. But at the same time as Allah says that it is wrong that they made this sharia up for themselves, it is still admirable that they are doing something with sincerity. If only they had done something with sincerity which actually was proper obedience and ibadah that Allah had commanded. So Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse number 82 that the reason why the Christians will be closest to the believers is that there are among them qasisina wa ruhbana. There are monks among them. There are bishops, there are scholars, there are pious people among them. Wa annahum la yastakbiru. They have that same attribute that Surah Al Mu'mineen says the believers have. Al ladina hum fi salatihim khashi'un. They are humble. When they worship, when they pray before Allah, they don't think that I am the greatest person who ever existed, but they are humble. If they hear something of the truth, then they are willing to say, I didn't know it, but I have learned it now and I will accept it. They won't reject it. They won't be stubborn. Because of this attribute of humility, Allah says that they have some kind of affinity and closeness to the believers. When the Qur'an says that they have a closeness and that they are أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا The Qur'an is saying that we also should return the favor. We shouldn't look at the Christians. We shouldn't look at those Muslims who may not be followers of Ahlul Bayt. But they have a love of Ahlul Bayt. And they say that we have wilaya and we love Ahlul Bayt. We shouldn't be the ones to turn them away by our own hands. One more verse that I will recite. This is the verse of Surah Al Hadid. I believe it is Surah number 57, verse number 28. 
And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says that after Nuh and after Ibrahim السلام, we sent many different prophets. Many prophets were sent to Bani Israel. They preached, they taught, and then Allah sent the final prophet before our own prophet of Islam, وَقَفَّيْنَا بِعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمِ We sent, Allah is speaking, Isa ibn Maryam. وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْإِنْجِيلَ وَجَعَلْنَا فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ رَعْفَةً وَرَحْمَةً That Allah says, we sent after the prophets of Bani Israel, Isa ibn Maryam. We gave him the Injil. وَجَعَلْنَا فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ رَعْفَةً وَرَحْمَةً and Allah says, I placed in the hearts of those who follow Isa ibn Maryam, ra'fa wa rahma, compassion and mercy. So there is something about Prophet Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, those who accepted Isa alayhi salam, even if they only grasped part of his message. But it was enough for them to have a sense of universal compassion and mercy and ra'fa and rahma. And we should recognize that. But we shouldn't think that this is because of the Christians. It is something which is a shared part of the belief of the Muslims and the Christians. Please recite salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 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 It is a shared part of the heritage of the Muslims and the Christians. Those who follow Isa ibn Maryam and have Ra'fa and Rahma in their heart, it is the Christians and it is the Muslims. And for this reason, Muslims are to be welcoming and to be open to the Christian community. Two verses of the Quran that I have recited, and Surah Al-Ma'idah, just for those of you who were interested in tafsir, it is to be one of the last surahs which was revealed. So this wasn't an early message of the Quran that was abrogated later on. The Quran is calling us not to confuse our beliefs, not to say that it's okay if you believe Jesus is God and we don't believe Jesus is God. No. Those beliefs are not okay. But we can have a relationship and we can have a mutual understanding and even mutual respect on the basis of our compassion and on the basis of our mercy and sharing our charitable acts and being forces for assistance and for good in the broader community. There is a basis for unity with Christians, there is a basis for mutual respect with Christians, and that is contained in these verses of the Qur'an. Sure. And now I will move on, let me just make one other point with regard to the celebrations that the Christian community has. If you look at the fatawa of our fuqaha, they say that <coughs> there is nothing wrong in a Muslim showing some kind of re recognition and respect to their holidays, even when it comes, for example, to a Christmas tree, just to use an example, or other forms of celebration that are found in the Christian community. The standard that the fuqaha have mentioned is that you are not permitted as a Muslim, I am not permitted as a Muslim, to encourage or legitimize a false religion. And I am not permitted to encourage or to join in any kind of facade or un-Islamic practice. If there is a celebration or there is a gathering where alcohol is being served, where the gathering is not in accordance with Islamic values, then I am not allowed to go there. If my participation in a certain gathering or in a certain service, for example, in a church, that will seem to legitimize that worship, or that considering of Jesus to be a God, then I am not permitted to do that. But if there is a recognition of a holiday, if there is a recognition of a belief by the Christians where I am not doing so, then it is not haram for a Muslim to give his respects or her respects, to wish a happy holiday, to pay that kind of a cordial respect, and if it is not a time of mourning in our own calendar, even to go and to partake in some of those celebrations. As long as we are not participating in anything where there is facade, where there is an un-Islamic practice being done, and as long as we are not 
supporting or legitimizing by our words, by our actions, by our presence, a false religion. And there is nothing haram in a Muslim respecting those religious practices. And if you look at Ahlul Bayt, one of the beautiful things about Ahlul Bayt is that they were always able to attract even those who had scholars and had institutions of learning and had a long history of sophisticated civilization and religious practice. Have you ever wondered why on the journey to Karbala, several members of the family of Imam Hussein, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Muhammad ibn Hanafi, others, one of the pieces of advice they gave to Imam Hussein is, oh, our master, why don't you go to Yemen, where you have some Shia? That is one of the things which some of you may have heard in history. Why did they say that? Why did Imam Hussein have Shia in Yemen? When did Imam Hussein ever live in Yemen? The reason is that in the final years of his prophetic mission, the Prophet sent people to try to convey Islam to the people of Yemen. He sent Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid ibn Walid was one of the learned and the sophisticated members of Quraysh. When Quraysh had to do some kind of negotiation with Abyssinia, with the Romans, with other powerful kingdoms, Khalid ibn Walid was one of the people whom they would send in those kinds of important gatherings and military campaigns. But when he went to try to convey Islam to the people of Yemen, he stayed there for weeks and then for months and nobody became Muslim. How was he going to convey Islam who didn't have that kind of practice and that spirit of Islam? Words are not enough. When these missions of the other companions were unsuccessful, then the Prophet of Islam called Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib to his presence. He sent Imam Ali to go and convey Islam to the people of Yemen. And Imam Ali was only there for a short time. The entire tribe of Hamdan, the en entire tribe of Madhij, the entire tribe of Himyar, tribes, not individuals, they accepted Islam. It was as if the Prophet himself had gone to Yemen. The same thing that the Prophet himself was able to do in Medina and elsewhere, Imam Ali did in Yemen. And from that time, the people of Yemen, until today, they have been lovers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam. That is why when Imam Hussain was going to Kufa, people came and said, why don't you go to Yemen? You have Shia there, you have lovers there, they will protect you. But the Imam said that I have a different message and a different mission to follow. And the Imam continued on his path towards Kufa, which eventually led to Karbala. This Karbala is the fact that when the Ashura has been sent to the Ashura and the Ashura has been sent to the Ashura, then after that, the Prophet has been given to the Ashura that Allah has given them. Ibn Ziyad has تمام اہل کوفہ کو مسجد کوفہ میں جمع کیا اور ایک خطبہ ابن زیاد نے اس مسجد میں دیا کہ جس میں اہل بیت علیہ السلام اور امام حسین کی شان میں گستاخی کی ان کی شہادت پہ خوشی کا اظہار کیا اور یہ جملہ بھی کہا کہ نعوذ باللہ اللہ نے یزید کو اپنے دعوے میں سچا اور حسین ابن علی کو اپنے دعوے میں جھوٹا سرابط کیا اب کوفے کے مسجد میں ہزاروں کا مجمع تھا لیکن کسی کی جرت نہیں تھی کہ ابن زیاد کو اس موقع پہ جواب دے ایک بوڑھا صحابی تھا امیر المومنین کا ضعیف و ناتوان جسم تھا دونوں آنکھوں میں نابینا تھا لیکن دل میں ایمان کا جذبہ اور ایمان کی طاقت تھی عبداللہ ابن عفیف عزدی وہ کھڑے ہو کے بغیر کسی خوف کے کہتے ہیں کہ اے ابن زیاد یہ تُو نے کیسے جرت کی کہ حسین ابن علی میرے مولا کی شان میں یہ گستاخی کی جھوٹا تو تُو ہے اور جس نے تجھے کوفے کے اوپر والی بنایا ابن زیاد کو غصہ آیا 
اور اپنے سپاہیوں کو حکم دیا کہ عبداللہ ابن عفیف کو گرفتار کر کے فوراً قتل کر دیا جائے لیکن جیسے ہی سپاہیوں نے تلواریں نکالی اور عبداللہ کی طرف بڑھنے لگے تو ازد کے قبیلے کے سینکڑوں جوان کھڑے ہوئے اور کہا کہ یہ ہمارے قبیلے کا محترم و معزز فرد ہے اور ان کی شان میں کوئی گستاخی نہیں ہو سکے گی تلوارے انہوں نے نکالی اور عبداللہ ابن عفیف کو مسجد سے بچا کے گھر تک پہنچایا اس مجمع میں ابن زیاد کچھ کر نہیں سکا عبداللہ ابن عفیف کو کوئی نقصان نہیں پہنچا سکا یہ افسوس ہے کہ اہل بیت بھی اسی وقت کوفے کے راستے میں تھے اسیروں کا قافلہ کوفے کے راستے میں تھا اور عبداللہ ابن عفیف کو بچانے کے لیے ہزاروں تلوارے حاضر تھی لیکن آل رسول کی مدد کے لیے ایک تلوار بھی نہ تھی وہ اسیروں کا قافلہ کوفے میں وارد ہوا اور جب اگلا دن ہوا تو صبح کو کوفے کی گلیوں اور بازاروں سے اسیروں کو پھرایا گیا روایتوں میں ملتا ہے کہ کوفہ کی عورتیں اور بچے جب ان اسیروں کو دیکھا تو رحم اور ترس ان کے دلوں میں آیا تو انہوں نے اپنے بچوں سے کہا کہ کھانے اور خجور اور روٹی کے کچھ ٹکڑے لا کر ان اسیروں کو ان یتیموں کو دے دیا جائے تو جیسے ہی وہ کھانا بچوں کو ملا تو کچھ بچوں کو نادانی میں یہ ٹکڑے انہوں نے ہاتھ میں پکڑے اور کھانا شروع کیا تو اس وقت ام کلسوم آگے بڑھی اور کہا یا اہل الکوفہ ان صدقہ علینا حرام ہے اہل کوفہ کیا تم نہیں جانتے ہم پر صدقہ حرام ہے اور پھر ام کلسوم آگے بڑھ کے ان بچوں کے ہاتھوں سے وہ نوالے لیے اور دوبارہ کوفہ والوں کی طرف پھینک دیے ایک عورت تھی ایک خاتون ایک معظمہ تھی کوفہ میں ام حبیبہ نام تھا وہ جب یہ جملہ سنتی ہیں کہ ان صدقہ علینا حرام وہ حیرت کی حالت میں آگے بڑھتی ہیں کہتی ہیں کہ اے اسیروں آپ کون لوگ ہیں صدقہ تو صرف آل رسول پہ حرام ہے اور کسی پہ تو حرام نہیں ہے تو جناب زینب آگے بڑھتی ہیں کہتی ہیں کہ ام حبیبہ کیا تم نے نہیں پہچانا بیس سال ہی تو گزرے ہیں کوفے میں آپ تم میری کنیز ہوتی تھی کیا تم نے زینب کو نہیں پہچانا ام حبیبہ نے غور سے دیکھا اور پھر کہا کہ اگر واقعی آپ زینب ہیں تو بتائیے کہ آپ کے حسین کہاں ہیں جس زینب کی میں کنیز ہوتی تھی وہ کہیں پہ بھی اپنے پیارے حسین کے بغیر نہیں جایا کرتی تھی تو جناب زینب نے زبان سے جواب نہیں دیا آنکھوں میں آسو آگئے ہاتھوں سے اشارہ کیا کہا کہ ام حبیبہ آپ نے نہیں پہچانا دیکھو سامنے وہ نیزہ ہے نیزے کے اوپر جو سر ہے وہ میرے حسین ابن علی کا سر ہے انہا لیلہ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ وَسَيْعَلَمُ الَّذِينَ غَلَمُوا وَإِنَّا قَلَبِينَ